Hey, today we are talking about the new Apple iMac 24 inch, it used to be 21.5, it's the 4.5K screen, as you can see, got the pretty blue color, because there's only a few colors that they had in stock. I really wanted the orange one, but that was a special order, and I'm not special enough that Apple sends them to me, so I gotta go old school and actually go pick one up. So, M1 chip, eight gig of RAM, my test unit is the 512 SSD, let's take a look and see what we think. Look, it's an iMac. We all know what to expect. It's an all-in-one computer. Screen is built in on the new M1 powered machines. These suckers are thin. I mean, seriously thin. They're saying it's about 11 and a half millimeters. I'm not gonna argue. They kept the chin on it. There's been a lot of talk about the chin. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people think it's a design language decision so that it looks unique and it's an identifier that's separate from all the other monitors. I get it. I mean, it makes sense. I still think they could have just put it in the back. Here's, here's what puzzles me. They can make a MacBook Air with the same insides, M1 chip, eight gig of RAM, 256, 512 SSD. They can make it like super thin. They can make the iPad Pro with the same specs super thin. Why not just put it behind and still keep the same thickness or even make it a little bit thinner? I think they could have, they just chose not to. So it does look like it was a deliberate intentional decision to keep the design of the iMac the way that it's been for years and years with this kind of bezel around the edges, this chin at the bottom. Some people like it, some people don't. Personally, I'm not a great big fan, especially don't like the colors. I don't know how you go from this kind of you know deep, deep blue that's beautiful, and then you kind of turn it around to this kind of pale blue thing that's going on here, and they're all like that. The orange is a really deep orange on the back, and it almost looks like a salmon color on the front. The, the pinky red looks almost red on the back and pinky on the front. You've really got to be in the mood for these kind of colors. And then you've got this white bezel thing going on. And a lot of people don't like it. Again, I, I get it. You know, there's a reason most bezels are black because black contrasts so well with photos, with video, with graphics. Having a white edge works with some colors, not so much with others. But they were obviously going for this unique, identifiable look. If it was black, it would just blend away and you wouldn't see it. Take your pick. If you like it, it's your choice. If you don't, it's your choice. Personally, not a huge fan, but overall, fit and finish, build quality. Look, it's an Apple. I mean, it's it feels great. The color depth is great. It, it feels solid. One of the things that's always puzzled me with iMacs, and it still puzzles me with these, I know they make a version with the Visa mounts if you want to put it on a wall, but I wish they could make a good-looking iMac that's actually height adjustable. This is a small iMac. Normally, I would go with a 27. I'm hoping they're going to stretch that to a 30 and keep that big, big size. For people who work on a device all day, especially in graphics and video, and I do a little bit of creative stuff, that's definitely the, the sweet spot size-wise. I've been working on this, and personally, I find it too small. If this is a family computer in your living room, in your kitchen, kind of a sit down, get some stuff done, and leave, or maybe on your desk at work, it's going to look awesome, and it's going to be super functional, and it's probably going to be big enough. For me, I kind of felt like I was using a, a blown up iPad. Do you remember when the iPads came out and everybody said, oh, you know what? It's basically just like an overblown phone. Well, now I feel the same about the iMac. It feels like an overblown iPad. It's the same specs, it's the same guts, it's the same everything except for the OS. I gotta tell you, sometimes it feels like you're using an iPad. The, the system is being simplified and simplified. They're clearly converging. I'll be curious to see what comes out at WDC in June and how much more they bring these two together. I don't know, it, it feels different. That's the best way I can describe it. Also, you get the new updated keyboard and the new updated mouse, both blue, can't really see those colors. We'll get some better shots for you. One of the things that really puzzled me about the keyboard, and I've got my old one here so you can see the difference. Just take a look at those corners. You see how rounded this one is and how kind of squared off that one is? I kind of like the square. I don't, I'm not feeling the love for the rounded. It's almost like we've gone a little bit too, you know, crazy with the rounded corners. I don't know what it is. It just doesn't look like a rectangle. The keys and everything kind of feel the same. You've got the touch ID on the corner. So that's a new one. That touch ID can actually do touch ID for multiple family members. They do some Apple Voodoo over wireless and they make it all work. It's, it's touch ID. It's the same as if you've got a MacBook or, you know, previous iPhones that use touch ID as well. 
I still find it frustrating. I've said this before, I'm probably gonna say it again. Why do I have to press the touch ID like three or four times when I'm logging into a website for the username and then I gotta press it again for the password and then if it doesn't work or whatever, I gotta press it again. Why can't I just press it one time and bam, I'm done. If I'm using a non-touch ID iMac, it seems so much quicker and easier in some ways to just log into a website when I've got a saved password in my Safari passwords. I wish it was that quick with Touch ID. I get the security and all the rest of it, but if it's good enough for my non-Touch ID iMac, I feel like I'm probably okay with it. I'm in my house. It's not like I'm going to be taken in the car and someone's going to be like breaking a window and stealing it. So, no. Nah. Uh, mouse, exactly the same. Never been a fan of these mice. I use the trackpad. I think most people um, tend to prefer the trackpad to the mouse from my experience, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Still got the most bizarre charging port on earth. Why, oh why, is the charging port on the bottom of the mouse? If you can figure out how to charge it while you're using it, let me know, all power to you. But I don't think there's a way, which means you're gonna stop using it when the juice runs out, so make sure it doesn't run out at the start of a day when you've got some really important stuff to do, because if it does, you're gonna be out of luck. So onto performance, it's an M1 Mac. If you have used a MacBook Air, if you've used a MacBook Pro, you know what to expect. There's not a whole lot of difference. It is quick, it is snappy, it is zippy. It's a great SSD inside of this machine. The eight gig of RAM is the unified architecture, which we talked about on the MacBook Pro review we did earlier in the year, which means that everything is kind of all fused onto this one system on a chip and it makes things move around quicker and it makes everything feel a little bit quicker. I know there's rumors of the new M1X or M2 chip that's about to drop. Everybody's talking about the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros. We don't know for sure yet whether they're going to announce them in a couple of weeks at WWDC. Anywho, the big question mark you got to ask yourself if you're looking at one of these iMacs, is it worth the extra money from the Mac Mini? The problem Apple has right now is they released the Mac Mini at $699 and it's basically $599 everywhere right now at 8 gig 256. That same $599 machine, given today's street price, is selling for $1299 in the iMac. And then they also did what is typical and stripped away some features. So you only got two USB-C ports instead of the four. You only got a regular keyboard with no uh, Touch ID, and you also got the inferior chip, which is in the MacBook Air, that has the seven core GPU versus the eight core GPU. It's up to you whether those things are worth the $200 to bump you to the 1499, but the 699 slash 599 Mac Mini is actually the eight core GPU chip, which means really it's comparable with the 1499 iMac. So today, you are talking about a $900 difference for exactly the same performance and exactly the same specifications. The only difference is, do you get the keyboard and mouse included if you even like it? And if you don't, that might not be such a bad thing. And what monitor do you want? Now, it's a beautiful monitor. It's 4.5K. It's a retina display. I mean, it looks glorious. Is it a $900 monitor or an $800 monitor? Would you go and spend that or would you just still be over the moon with a three or $400 4K monitor? That's a choice you've got to make. But personally, I think the gap's too wide. I think there's definitely an element of convenience. I love the fact that you've got like the magnetic power adapter and it's just one cord coming out the back. I'm not having to worry about speakers and webcams and all these other kind of things. But at the end of the day, you could buy a Mac mini with a great killer 32 inch 4K screen which is much more usable for the kind of work I'm doing and for a lot of the work that you guys are gonna be doing, anything to do with graphics, um, you know, video, even multiple spreadsheets, multiple windows. I think you're gonna enjoy the screen real estate. You're gonna find this restricted after I've been working on it and using it. I find it too small and I definitely wouldn't be keeping this. I would want the larger size. And so you've got this real world trade-off and it's a tough one. I don't, I don't know if it's worth it or not. Again, it depends on your usage case. It depends on what's important to you. If looks are everything, you want clean lines, you want a simple one cable setup, and you're willing to pay the extra, I mean, go ahead and go for it. I've got a horrible feeling in about three to four months, these are gonna feel like the bottom of the food chain when the new ones come out that are bigger, that are more powerful. That's really gonna be the, the, the power machine that a lot of mid-tier users are gonna to wanna to go for. And I'm sure there'll be the high power one as well. They're talking about you know, 16, 32 core GPUs and things on these new chips, whatever they call them. 
I think this is going to be the baby of the run. And I think that's the reality of the current lineup that we've got from Apple. They told us a year ago that they were going to be transitioning from Intel to Apple Silicon, and they've taken a very cautious, careful approach. They've intentionally stepped it one by one by one, but all across the board, they're basically all the same. And I think this is this is the new architectural language we're going to see from Apple. They're going to bring into this good, better, best, you know, but good is going to be, you know, that M1 lower level. This is our entry level machine and we're going to make it entry level in every way. And then you're going to have that better level in the middle, you know, with the 16 core GPU, for example. And then you're going to have that best when you get to the 32 core GPU. But trust me, you're going to pay for it. Don't think those new iMacs are going to be cheap when they come out replacing the 27s and don't think the Mac Pro replacement or the iMac Pro replacement is going to be cheap either because they are absolutely pushing the boat on what they can charge for things. They always have. It would appear that they always will and that's that's the price you pay to play in Apple's little garden. You're wondering what it sounds like? It's a great question. Now, if you've used an iPad Pro, it's one of the things I've actually been most interested in and definitely giving it a thumbs up on this one. It sounds pretty awesome. One thing Apple does exceptionally well, and I keep saying one thing, so evidently they do a few things really well, but one of the things they do really, really well is speakers in thin devices. I don't know why the other guys can't figure it out, but holy moly, my iPad Pro, those speakers sound killer for a device that's like this thick. And basically, from what I understand, they've taken that same magic, put it into here, created these down-firing speakers with little kind of volumeric chambers and things, and... Look, I mean, it's a thin machine. We're not talking about Sonos quality here or, you know, Bose, bass and, you know, rocking the house down, but it's impressive and it's very, very, very good. On the subject of sound, the webcam and the audio from the webcam, it's got a, I think it's got a, a three microphone array now that's picking up audio. The audio is great. I mean, it really is. And the webcam is definitely a step up from the MacBook Pro, MacBook Air. They get 720p cams. This is a 1080p cam. I did some test shots with it. My studio looks awesome. You know, the depth of field, I mean, obviously, you're not going to get that kind of bokeh effect, but, you know, even at long distance, everything stayed sharp, everything stayed true. One of the really, really neat little touches that you're probably wondering why I'm wearing this is a necklace. Um, the cables, they finally switched to this kind of braided, you know, style of cable. It feels really soft in your hand. It just feels yummy. And the power cable is the same, and they're color-coded. Look, PC manufacturers, can you start to take some hints from these guys? Color-coded mouse, color-coded keyboard, color-coded power cables, color-coded desktop wallpaper when you turn it on. Those things are important. We like the little touches. So, you know, try harder. I'm not saying just copy everything Apple's doing, but come on, let's get a little bit of uniformity around what we're building here. Um, some of you guys do a great job with the PCs that you make and the Windows laptops. Let's just... Let's just just, you know, notch it up a little bit so we're not getting five power bricks that are literally the size of bricks when we could get one sleek, cute little thing with, with a, a colorful, pretty little braided thing dropping out of it. Another thing that's of interest to some of you, not all of you, but some of you, this could be a portable computer. At this size, I could absolutely see somebody dropping it in a flight case. It's not too heavy. It's easily movable. It's a single unit. You can have a keyboard and mouse at the office, a keyboard and mouse at home. And if you have to go into the office, you could just pick this thing up, put it under your arm. I've seen people do it with the old iMacs. It's going to be way easier with this, given how much thinner it is and how much lighter it is. I can absolutely see this as a portable. The trade-off's going to be, if you were doing that on a regular basis, would you do this or the Mac Mini? Well, I'd do the Mac Mini, hands down. I'd just set up identical monitor stations with keyboards and mice or docks. I'd save money and I could just pick the mini up, throw it in my bag and away I go. I think that would be the way to do it if you're doing it on a regular basis. But as a one-off, I think so. Let me know what you think. If you've got any questions, ask me below. I'll spend a little bit of time with it. If you've used a MacBook Pro or you've used a MacBook Air, you know how it performs. It's basically identical. The only question is, do you want the color on the back of your monitor or can you live with a, a good old fashioned you know, black plastic one and save a bunch of money? And the second question is, do you prefer that simple one cable, nothing else around, versus maybe having to do a little bit of cable management and getting your rig set up the way you want it with two screens or one big screen and all that kind of goodness. Uh, the choice is yours. They've put out a great all-in-one. Um, is it the best all-in-one available? It's definitely the slimmest. It's definitely one of the prettiest. 
I don't know if I describe it as the best or not. Some people need to use Windows. Some people don't care about the operating system. We talk about this a lot for entrepreneurs and business folks. You know, I care about how Google Chrome runs. I care about how I can interface with Microsoft Office 365 online through my browser. Those things are most important. The hardware is almost secondary and the OS is almost secondary as long as it's working and running, which for the most part both do. So love to hear some thoughts and uh, I'll catch you on the next one.